Um, but thanks everybody for having me today. My name is Mike Pfeiffer, Microsoft Azure MVP. My talk is gonna be about um, building and deploying serverless apps. Uh, the focus will be Azure DevOps, but I'll also talk about GitHub Actions. And I will, what I'll do is I'll save my slide deck that I wasn't able to share. I'll save that as a PDF, give it to Jason, because I do have a few links in the slide deck. Let me uh, jump over to our website. So uh, I run a company called cloudskills.io. We do a bunch of Azure training. We used to do consulting, um, not really doing that so much anymore, just because of the big need for cloud training. And so I had this in my deck. I'm just navigating over to this blog post. So a couple of resources that I'm gonna share today. Um, number one is gonna be this blog post that uses a reference application uh, that Peter, the author here, um, he built this reference application, wrote a whole blog post about it, and along with it is a uh, open source application. So you guys, if you're watching this video later, you can come find this blog post, you can follow along with some of the demos that I'm gonna explain. Uh, the other resource that I had in the deck, let me go to Azure. Oh, you know what? Peter's got a link to it in this article as well. It's got a link to um, an article in the Azure uh, Reference Architecture Center for serverless web applications. So this is also another really great resource that I'm gonna point you guys to. Let me open this diagram in a bigger window here. Zoom out just a bit. So I'm gonna talk about some of these resources here, some um, general architecture, then I will take you guys into doing a deployment and show you kind of the mechanics and all the things that are involved here. Um, the idea with this one, this particular reference architecture that I'm gonna walk you through, um, it's kind of two-pronged, right? It's, it's gonna help somebody that's an operations person figure out how to deploy. It'll also help you as a developer um, figure out how to deploy these serverless apps. Um, and so there's kind of a, you know, it's kind of a two-pronged two approach, I guess I would say. It, it's aimed at both the developer audience and potentially a DevOps engineer or somebody that's more operationally minded. So I'm not gonna spend a bunch of time writing code. Um, I'm gonna explain the architecture. I'm gonna show you how we build the infrastructure dynamically in Azure DevOps or GitHub Actions, whatever we wanna do. And then once the infrastructure is up and running, how to deploy to it. And we're basically gonna use some of the components in this application architecture. So number one, you know, if serverless is a new thing for you, I would highly recommend going through and reading uh, this document, because it goes into you know, scalability considerations, high level best practices, security stuff, uh, cost considerations and things like that. But I wanna basically explain some of the architecture here, some of the services that are involved. Okay, so um, you know, we're talking about a serverless web application, that's one way to do serverless. But we, almost, we also may do um, event-driven automation using a serverless approach, right? So in the architecture center, they have a pretty good reference application that uh, kind of shows that model because you know basically processing events and doing event based automation you know opens up so many capabilities however you know as as a team of devs here another common use case right is a full blown serverless application both front end and back end so that's kind of what we're looking at here that'll be our focus for today's discussion so taking a look at what we have on the screen here right we've got on the far left uh, a user hitting a single web page or single page application. But essentially here's what's going on with this architecture. Top right on the far right, you might have seen this, at least for static content, right? Storage accounts in Azure uh, can do static website hosting. So it's very simple to provision a storage account, a general purpose version two storage account, enable static website hosting, and then you know, use whatever front end framework we want um, for that static website. Very easy to get set up and host your web page, your front end uh, from Azure Storage. Now, um, you know, there are things that have popped up recently from Microsoft Ignite's going on this week. So Azure Static Web Apps is also a service that's emerging. You don't have to use that, right? But you could, that's something that's still kind of new. And I was hoping I would see some Ignite stuff and see if they've done any updates to that, but I haven't yet. But however, you know, front end can go in the storage account if we want to do that, especially if we're doing, you know, some kind of SPA framework, um, makes it really easy to do. Now you also see in this architectural mix here, the CDN, Azure CDN, uh, not required and not something I'm actually going to deploy in this demo today, but really useful, right? So we can get static assets uh, closer to users, get those cached closer to users where they're at throughout the, uh, the entire global infrastructure. So Microsoft's got the Azure CDN. Uh, 
totally you know, usable, great service. Personally, over where I work and what we're doing, we use Cloudflare, amazing service. I love those guys and what they do. Um, so anyways, you know, CDN is a component, but what we're gonna do in this situation today is I'm gonna really just be focusing on a serverless backend. I'm not gonna be doing any front end stuff, uh, but as you would expect, right? And as you probably have, have messed around with a little bit, I would assume at some point, notice that they're you know, saying that the browser is gonna be doing Ajax requests against that front end or against the back end, right? So single page application, user is in their browser. Ultimately that's hitting the front end on a storage account. And in the browser, we've got our JavaScript running, uh, doing Ajax requests against the back end. That's what they're showing in the bottom half here of this screen. So um, kind of what we want to do here is focus on the API because that's what I've actually got deployed for you. I'm going to show you how we not only build that infrastructure as part of our continuous integration and deployment processes, but also deploy to the infrastructure. So what do we got in, um, in the mix here for our API? Well, we got API management, Azure API management, we got a function app, and then we got Cosmos DB for storing records for this API. Okay, so basically what we're doing here API management, great service to put in front of a function app or any other API you might be building. Gives you the ability to do uh, rate limiting. Um, you can do, you could require people to register for your API and get a, uh, an API key that way. Tons of stuff in there, right? But essentially the policies that we can put in API management really are, are what make it interesting. And we can put that right in front of a function app, require those Ajax calls to go through API management. Um, but it does take a little bit of time to, to architect and deploy that. So the automation and the code that I'm going to share with you today, um, it's just going to have your function app and then your Cosmos DB implementation. Okay, so the function app is going to have a handful of functions to create, read, update, and delete questions out of a Q&A uh, database, if you will. We'll store those records in Cosmos DB. So the function app will be communicating directly with Cosmos DB and um, you know, we'll be hitting the function app from the outside. We can imagine we're hitting that from uh, some web front end. If we want to test it, you know, we use something like Postman or, or one of those other tools. So that's the general architecture that we're going to deal with. Let me take you over to the Azure portal and show you what I got. So here's my resource groups. I've got a resource group called CSQA. This is the infrastructure for this application. And so basically what we've got here is we've got a function app. I'll show you the functions that are in there. Um, this was actually uh, something that was developed locally and then ultimately built and deployed from Azure DevOps. So because of that, when we're looking at the function app, um, we're gonna see that you know, it's kind of like show and read only. Okay, so we're expecting to do our code um, updates and our development locally then we push to a repository of some kind. And depending on how we have our DevOps pipeline set up, that'll dictate how that code gets deployed and, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, in real life, right, if we're following Microsoft's best practices, we would have separate subscriptions for development and production. So we might have, you know, a multi-stage pipeline scenario where we release to, you know, development QA or something like that and ultimately roll it into production once we've had a chance to test things and we're confident uh, in the setup, right? So all this infrastructure here, you know, it's very basic, but it was deployed uh, through infrastructure automation, specifically with an ARM template. All right, so let me start off by taking you guys through the code here. What we'll do here is go over to GitHub. Okay. So github.com slash cloud skills. And if we scroll down here, let's see, take a look at this guy. This is the code repository. <laughs> so my original plan was to clone this repository and bring it down and do a bunch of stuff here in Visual Studio Code. But since I can only share the browser, I'm just gonna uh, kind of point out a few things in here. So number one, there's an Azure Pipelines YAML document that has uh, all the definitions for the build and release for this application. Once I take you through all this stuff, I'll also talk about GitHub Actions and how you can basically model what we're doing here uh, in GitHub Actions as well. All right, but notice there's essentially in this repository a few folders, one for automation scripts that we might use to help us during the deployment process. I'll kind of explain what's going on there. 
um, there is the code that deploys the infrastructure. So all the ARM templates and stuff like that. And then there's the function app itself that is the backend API. And so again, I'll include this in a PDF. It, you know, it's basically this blog post for this reference application. So we're talking about building, deploying a REST API uh, using Azure Functions and Azure DevOps, and ultimately also GitHub Actions. So this was written by Peter. Definitely check out his stuff. He's got some really cool content on our platform here. Um, but yeah, that's the idea. And uh, he kind of walks through some of the basics here of like cloning the repo, running the templates and stuff. So again, I wanted to give you guys something you could use after this talk, you could follow along with. And so basically what you would do here is once you clone this entire repo, right, you would switch into this folder, you could deploy this manually, but I'll also show you um, how you would deploy this infrastructure as part of your pipeline. So it's not something you have to do manually. But uh, you know, if you've ever worked with ARM templates, you know, generally what you got here is a main template that has all of your resources defined. And then you know, sometimes you include a parameters file that will answer um, the inputs that you would need to dynamically define the names of your resources when you launch the template, right? So let me show you this real quick, Azure deploy.json. Um, usually people go to sleep when I start showing them JSON templates for ARM, right? And uh, it's uh, one of those things where uh, it just kind of feels like a rat's nest sometimes when you're dealing with these templates because they're really verbose. Um, you know, it's not strongly typed, so it's easy to miss, you know, a closing double quote, stuff like that. Um, and you might have heard Microsoft is now creating um, basically a new language extension on top of ARM templates called Azure Bicep. So it won't be as, as verbose. But basically what this template does, right, it has all the input parameters for like naming the application, um, the Cosmos DB database name, things like that. And then it's just got all the resources in it. So this isn't going to be, you know, I'm not going to have time to like go through developing ARM templates, but essentially um, this thing is going to set up all the infrastructure that we need. I'm sure you guys have kind of seen that pattern, right? So that's kind of step number one, <clears throat> excuse me. And then our article that Peter wrote, you know, he explains basically bringing this thing down, customizing the inputs, uh, launching the template and getting your infrastructure built. Okay. So that's kind of the big idea. Number one. Now, when it comes to the infrastructure itself and you know, thinking about serverless, let me go into the function app itself. You guys may have run into this in the past, but probably the biggest consideration with the function app is the billing or the pricing model, right? So when you're thinking about architecting, serverless solution, whether it's for you know, back end API like this or to build a event driven automation solution, um, those concepts will dictate how you pay for the function app. So for example, if I was building this completely net new, watch, I come over to function app, click on add. When we're on the hosting screen, right, there is the plan type, super important concept. So there's consumption, premium app service plan. Now consumption is interesting because that's truly that truly captures the essence of what we mean when we're talking about serverless, right? So yeah, there's servers somewhere. We're just not dealing with anything. We're not thinking about VMs. We're not worrying about, oh, do we have VMs in an app service plan? Like we don't have to think. That's the benefit of this. So with consumption, there's already a managed fleet of infrastructure somewhere that Microsoft's got. And when, you know, for example, an HTTP call triggers one of your serverless functions, you know, if that happens a hundred times in five minutes, Microsoft is going to figure out how to scale that for you under the consumption model, right? So the big benefit there, no pre-provisioning infrastructure. We don't have to think about HA. You know, we don't have to think about that high availability stuff, load balancing, patching systems. And also we're just paying for code as it executes, right? And so probably not a big departure from things you've heard. But you know, it's kind of interesting, right? We, there's also free credits for Microsoft. So there's tons of free executions under the consumption plan when you're getting started. And if you go past that, then you start paying, right? So you know, we're thinking about servers less, we're leaving idle resources on the table less because we're only paying for code when it executes. Definitely an interesting model. Uh, the catch, right, with consumption is something that you may have heard of, which is the cold start situation, right? So the platform, if it hasn't called your function in a while and you're in the consumption model, it's like, hey, request comes in, we got to get your code loaded, boom. Once it's in there, cool, we'll do what we need to do. Um, but that cold start, if you're truly doing one of these, you know, 
interactive serverless web applications, a user could feel that latency, right? They click the submit button, for example, on a web form, and it takes 10 seconds for the function to execute, right? So there's things we can do on the developer side to work with that, but it's challenging, right? And so because of that, there's some other options, right? So if we hit the drop down. in addition to serverless, there's the app service plan billing model. So if you're already doing websites on app service, and you're paying for an app service plan, you might be able to just reuse that existing infrastructure. And so that, you know, technically is a managed service, but it's, you know, there is a concept of servers under the hood. There is a concept in app service, depending on the plan type, of having multiple systems uh, auto scale out to support the compute environment, right? So technically, it's not really serverless. So you're still gonna think about servers in a way. We're still gonna think about scalability uh, in the app service plan model. So, you know, that kind of, that's kind of a fine print thing. However, if that server is already there and you're already paying for it, that's, that capability is there, then you can just drop your function app on top of it and just kind of get it for free almost, right? If you're already paying for it for something else. There's also premium. So if you need, you know, let's say you need to isolate your compute infrastructure, even when it's managed. This is probably one of the biggest things that I've worked with uh, development teams on over the last year and a half what would be, you know, isolating managed services. And what I mean by that is literally taking the function app itself and putting it inside the VNet with my virtual machines. Uh, and maybe my network team has some kind of, you know, network virtual appliance in front of all the stuff that's coming into the VNet, right? And when you get in the enterprise, it's a very common scenario to put managed infrastructure uh, inside of VNet. So we can do that with a premium function app plan uh, that also, you know, it's going to cost more, but we're also going to get some dedicated infrastructure. So again, to me, not necessarily serverless, but good in a scenario where you don't need, where you don't want cold starts. You need um, more capacity, maybe more um, firepower, if you will. And then also, you know, network isolation, dropping a function app right into your own VNet. It's completely isolated. So those are a few of the things to think about in terms of, um, best practices. And most of this stuff that I'm talking about is all documented in this uh, reference architecture. Uh, it's still really early too, right? For serverless. I mean, it's not like everybody's doing it. So some of these patterns and recommendations are emerging. Okay. So that's what we got going on so far. So if I was going to, you know, kind of get it set up to where I could push my code into a repository and have all of this stuff just kind of magically get built. Let me start off by showing you what that looks like in Azure DevOps, all right? So I've got a project here in Azure DevOps called QAPI for my question API. And uh, let's go over repos. So number one, I've got the code that I was just showing you in GitHub. I've got a version of it here in Azure repos. Um, so, you know, like I said, I'll, sh I'll talk about GitHub Actions as well, but nice thing about Azure DevOps is it's easy to create a free organization. If you already have a subscription, you know, it's not too difficult to get up and running and you can start for free, right? So you can just jump in there, create an organization, create a project. And if you've got a valid subscription, you, you're off and running, okay? So now that the code is available in here, I've updated my Azure Pipelines YAML file. Um, that's another thing too, right? If you're using Azure Pipelines or GitHub Actions for CI CD, everybody's doing pipeline configuration as code. And this is another thing that can kind of be like, oh man, spaghetti code, you know? Um, but at the end of the day, it's nice to be able to bring your pipeline configuration along with a repo. So when you're doing a hello world, right? You can just kind of import all this stuff and get going. Uh, reason I'm bringing it up is if you were to go off and clone this repository, or if you're just to come in here to a DevOps project in Azure DevOps and import that repo, you just want to update the variables. Um, there's a couple things like the Azure subscription, the resource group you want to deploy to. And the cool part is you could fill out these variables and this pipeline will actually build the infrastructure for you. So it's not like you have to first manually launch the ARM template. The whole pipeline process will take care of it for you. All right, so let me show you where this thing right here came from, the Azure subscription, because we need permissions, right? So when you're in a project in Azure DevOps, if you go to project settings, on the left, you go to service connections. You can see this is where I created my service connection, but 
you know, as long as I got an Azure subscription, I could do a DevOps project here in Azure DevOps, come into new service connection. You can see that we've got connection types for all kinds of different platforms. And then we can say Azure Resource Manager in this case, go to next, service principle, automatic, manual, those kinds of things. Uh, what I did for this use case is just did service principle automatic. And what that does when you go next and kind of finish this off is it's gonna ask you to authenticate. I've already done this, so I'm not gonna do it again. Once you authenticate, you just give your service connection a name. And then also notice that it's a scope. Um, there's a scope option as well. So you can scope it at the subscription, at the management group, which would be above your subscriptions. Um, and then you can also do a custom one like they were showing on the previous screen. So if you wanted to do a very explicit RBAC implementation and have this, you know, delegate controlled Azure pipelines in a very limited way, maybe to you know, just a single set of resources in your resource group and so on, you could do that. But essentially what I'm getting at here is this was the permissions model, the service connection that my pipeline configuration is gonna use. This is how it will, you know, take my code, and then go do deployments in Azure. This is the credentials it's gonna use essentially. So that's kind of step one to set up this project. Also what you'll find, and actually let me show you this. If you come over here to create a new project, let me just create a demo one, two, three. Create a private project, just build this out. Uh, if you wanted to kind of follow what I did, you could build a brand new project here. And when you go over to repos, you could just do an import repository and bring in that sample code that Peter built for you. So literally you just come over here, come to this repository, right? And this will be in the PDF that I'd leave for you guys. Grab the clone URL. And then what you can do here when you're in Azure repos, you just plug it in, do an import, and that'll bring that code into a project for you. Then you can modify um, the Azure DevOps YAML document, you can create a service connection in this project, and then you'll be off and running, okay? So import successful, it's a little slow there, but you know, basically once I import it, then I can go into the pipeline XAML file, I can change the subscription information after I create a service connection, I can just edit this right here, right? I can give this thing a new resource group name, change my location, so on and so forth, right? So that's kind of the idea. Let me go back over to the one that's already cooked. Back to repos. Okay, and so that's the idea. We've got the source code in Azure DevOps. And you know what we might want to do, since the uh, pipelines have been built using this YAML pipeline definition, come over here to pipelines. You can take a look. I've already run the pipeline a couple times. So first time I ran it, I had something set up wrong, so it failed. And then this, I fixed it, and then the second run was good. So coming into the pipeline itself, you can see it's a multi-stage pipeline. I'll show you the YAML in just a second but I think it'll make more sense to show this piece first. So think about it this way. You know, we've got our code in Azure repos in this case, could be in GitHub, that's fine. But whether the application developer or infrastructure developer is working on the code, either way, they can commit their change to the repository, right? Push that commit up here to Azure DevOps or GitHub, whatever it is, and then that can invoke this multi-stage pipeline. Uh, let's see, give me one second. Phone's ringing, I gotta mute it. So these stages are actually modeled inside the YAML document. So the build stage is not only gonna build our code, as this is a, a C-sharp based function app. So it's gonna run through the, you know, the build process. If we wanted to do any unit testing in there, we could. But it's also going to do a build of our infrastructure. So let me show you what the build stage is doing before I show you the YAML. You can see here, it's kind of just going through the process, checking our code out, doing a, a .NET build and publish and all that kind of stuff but it's also getting the uh, infrastructure templates ready to go. And I guess now that I'm looking at the pipeline definition, um, the, the deployment is actually happening in the deploy stage for the infrastructure, which is fine. And we all know that build, like the CI process should be fast, right? So if, um, if we're doing any infrastructure build in here, it would be something we wanna do quickly. So what we're doing in the build section or phase is just checking out the code, running a build, publishing our artifacts for uh, not only our application code, but also our ARM templates, uh, any scripts that we're gonna need during our deploy stage. And I'll show you the YAML manifest for this or definition for this in a second. But you know, once all that's figured out, then in here in the deploy stage, 
we grab the artifacts that were published in the previous stage, go off and do a couple of things, but mainly do an Azure deployment first and then deploy our code. All right, so you can see here on this task in this deploy stage, it's an Azure resource group deployment. So this deploys an ARM template to a resource group. Like I was saying, you can have a completely empty subscription, create this DevOps project, import the YAML file, fill out the variables. And then the first time you run the pipeline end to end, it'll build your infrastructure for you. And by default, ARM templates do uh, something they call an incremental deployment, meaning it's gonna look at the template, it's gonna look at the resource group you're targeting, and it's only gonna take you know, the things that are different. So if something hasn't been done in the resource group and it's in the template, ARM template system is gonna, or a resource group deployment is gonna take what's in the template and make it happen in the resource group. So on the first run, if it's empty, it's gonna build all the infrastructure you need. On the second run, if nothing's changed in the template, it's really just gonna skip it. It's not gonna do anything else. You know, and then so subsequent deployments um, can just focus on deploying your code. So there's a, a task towards the end of the deploy stage here that is you know, just doing your Azure Functions deployment. Uh, I would have showed you this locally here if I could share more than just my browser, but um, using Visual Studio Code or Visual Studio, I was gonna use Visual Studio Code on this Mac. Um, I was gonna run it locally with the uh, function runtime, show you I could debug it locally, uh, use the Cosmos DB emulator locally and all that kind of stuff. But you know, ultimately, same code gets deployed up to, to Azure, okay? So that's what's going on with this. So basically, if I go back over to the function app that we've got, take a look at functions, you can see that, you know, there's create, delete, update, and, you know, all the kind of similar operations you would expect in some kind of API that does something very basic, okay? In this particular case, these functions are secured with, um, with a function key, right? In the real world, I would put Azure API management in front of these probably, right, for best practices. But if I wanted to go off and call these um, at this point, right, locally, I could come in here, get the function URL. Um, I had Postman installed locally, I wasn't using it in a browser, so I won't really take the time to show you that right now, but basically I could come in here, get one of the function URLs, it's got the function key already in, in it right here, and then I go plug this into Postman and do a, you know, a get and all that kind of stuff. There's also, of course, ways for you to uh, create questions. So you send a JSON payload along with the requests, boom, add something to the Cosmos DB database, and I'll let you guys kind of go through and reverse engineer the code uh, for those, if you want to check that out. Nothing, nothing exotic, just very basic CRUD type of uh, functionality here. All right, cool. So let's go back over to um, Azure Pipeline to just look at the code. Again, I was going to pull this up in uh, Visual Studio Code, but uh, let me show you the uh, deployment pipeline YAML file. So the thing with Azure DevOps is they have kind of like the classic version where it was like graphical build and release where you, you know you do everything in the web portal and now they've moved on to you know they still support that classic model but now they've moved on to yaml only right so they do a pretty good job in the documentation of giving you a yaml primer i've also found that just like searching github for azure pipelines.yaml there's so many great examples of people have already put out there so sometimes i find stuff in other people's azure pipelines yaml file um, that I didn't even realize you could do, which is kind of cool. Uh, you do not need to call your pipeline Azure Pipelines.yaml, but just kind of by convention. So number one, there's a trigger. Commits to, in, uh, to master are gonna trigger this pipeline, right? We've got our variables set. They're gonna be reused over and over. There's a couple interesting things going on in here, even if you're already uh, familiar with Azure DevOps. So, you know, number one, we've got our stages declared here. This is that first stage we're gonna do a, a build. Stages are made up of jobs in Azure DevOps. And you can see here in underneath our jobs collection, we just have a single job that's called build, right? Um, here for the pool, we're basically just using a machine out of the hosted pool to run all these tasks for us. So it's just gonna be, if you look up here, uh, Windows Server 2016 machine with Visual Studio 2017 on it. And that's really easy to, you know, there's different images for different platforms out there. So that's what we're doing here. 
And then from there, in this job for building, we've got a handful of steps, right? You see the .NET Core CLI task. And when you see these, like you know, .NET Core CLI at two, that's like version two of the task. And ultimately, you know, what you're doing with these tasks, you're really just constructing the command line uh, syntax that needs to be taken out by the .NET Core CLI. And you guys might've seen this in the past, right? The first one we're gonna do is a build project. We've got our inputs here. We're saying, hey, look in the folder that we're checking out from the repo, look for our CS proj file, and then try to do a build from there, right? And then it goes on to archiving. So, you know, if you look at these tasks step-by-step, step, these are just happening in sequence, right? The machine comes up from the hosted pool, starts running through this task list. It's gonna build our project. Um, it's archiving it, right? So zipping up the project files. Uh, and then it's doing a bunch of other stuff. You know, in the IAC subfolder, we've got ARM templates. So it's copying these things over to something called the build artifact staging directory uh, on the instance that's running the pipeline. Ultimately, those get uh, packaged up as artifacts, right? So essentially what we're doing here is just compiling our application, taking our code, our infrastructure templates, and our scripts, kind of copying these over to the staging directory to where we ultimately will come down here and publish our artifacts. And this is just a construct in Azure DevOps. We're calling our artifacts for our, our infrastructure templates. We're calling it ARM. So we publish that artifact name, make it available to other stages in the pipeline later. We're also doing this with a script as well. So build, uh, publish build artifacts, we're doing a scripts folder. And there's actually a reason for this. And it's actually kind of, uh, kind of interesting. Let me show you this real quick. Let me head back over to my repo. Let me show you the infrastructure templates. So remember, here's my infrastructure template, right? We scroll all the way to the very bottom. ARM templates, and just like many other templating systems, infrastructure as code tools, uh, they can do outputs. And you know this is really useful because a lot of these dynamic names as part of our infrastructure get created during the build process, and we don't know what they are until the template is done executing. So outputs are useful because when we're standing up infrastructure, like getting a Cosmos DB database um, URL, right, the full uh, FQDN perhaps, or names of a function app based on different inputs that we provided, these outputs can be spit out by the infrastructure template when it's done. And then we can read these in as variables inside Azure DevOps. And so when Peter built this reference application, he basically included a PowerShell script that could be run inside the pipeline. So during deployment, ARM template executes, builds all this infrastructure, spits out Cosmos database account, the function app name that we need, and then he's got a script in there that runs as a subsequent task that grabs the outputs and then loads them into variables inside Azure DevOps pipeline. Insanely cool, right? So that whole concept of just-in-time infrastructure, you know, responding to a commit, standing up infrastructure, uh, and kind of gluing all this stuff together, that's one technique that's actually really cool. Um, so going back over to the pipeline's YAML file here, that's kind of what was going on there. That's why he was publishing some scripts along with this stuff. And you'll actually see it uh, in the deploy stage. So once build completes, right, we've got output artifacts to deploy our application and do our infrastructure deployments and stuff. There is a deploy stage. And uh, this is kind of cool, right? Just like we can see in some other tools, we've got dependency management. You see this a lot in other CI CD systems, other infrastructure as code systems. But we're saying here, the deploy stage depends on the build stage. And the condition, we're looking for a succeeded uh, operation on that previous stage, right? So we don't even want to kick this off if that one didn't, didn't finish. And by default, that's kind of how it works anyways. But this is kind of cool. When you have multiple stages, you can wire up this dependency chain and you got some conditional logic here. But again, with this one, very simple. Um, just one job for deployment. And then as you get into kind of the meat of this thing, he's got a strategy in here. And this is a concept you see in YAML-based pipelines, but really just a series of steps, right? So a couple of things he's doing in here is just echoing out some pipeline workspace details. This could be useful when you're debugging a pipeline. Like you're not sure, like on the file system, on these build and deployment agents, like where's the folder, like where's my code? So he's just kind of echoing some stuff out. He's got another script that's echoing out the default working directory. He's catting uh, a deployment template. Uh, 
I left these in here just because it's really useful to debug uh, a pipeline. So anyways, the meat of what's really happening is this task here, Azure Resource Group Deployment. So just kind of like I was talking about a few minutes ago, this is the task that'll do your ARM template deployments and then check out the uh, inputs. Okay, Azure subscription, it's gonna use a service connection that we got out there. It's gonna use the resource group name that's uh, de de declared as a variable in our pipeline document. It's got the location coming in from our variables. And then finally, it's just like, hey, where's the ARM template on the file system from where we downloaded the artifacts from the previous stage? Where's the parameter files? It's got the answers to our parameters. What's the name of this particular deployment? And what do we got for deployment outputs? So anyways, kind of the template runs, builds the infrastructure. Then he's got a PowerShell script in here where he's parsing the outputs in the template, right? And he's loading those up uh, essentially uh, so they're available in Azure DevOps. You could reverse engineer that script you know, in the repo if you wanted to see what's going on there. And then so once the infrastructure is done on, on these two tasks right here, essentially, right? This would work if you had no infrastructure to start with. Once the infrastructure is up and running, there's finally a task at the very end, very simple. Azure function app deployment task. And you can see here, it's just same thing. Which subscription, what type of app, and then what's the actual name and where's the package, right? This is just a zip file that was created during our build stage. So we, you know, basically that's the idea. We change any code, kicks off the pipeline, creates the infrastructure if we need it, and then deploys our code into a function app, okay? So that's a big picture on that one. And then let's see, there's one other thing that I wanted to mention. Um, let's see. Well, let's just take a look at doing a change here. Um, well, actually, you know what? You take a look at our pipelines. This one already ran, is already successful, right? So I think you guys get the gist of this. Notice it took about three minutes, 49 seconds. So with my final uh, minutes here, let me talk about doing all this in um, GitHub Actions here. Let's just go over to my, my GitHub account. So doing this in GitHub Actions, not really that big of a difference once you understand Azure DevOps or if you've already worked with Azure DevOps and you haven't done GitHub Actions, very, very simple to deal with, in my opinion. Um, so here I am signed into my GitHub repository. And I don't have that particular application set up as um, a GitHub Actions demonstration. But I did have another one in here. Let me see, was it this one? Yeah, I think it was this one. So a simple free reader, go to Actions. Well, maybe it wasn't this one. But anyways, here's what you can do, right? If you forked the repo from our repository over to your own, head over to it and then go to actions. This is where you can start with GitHub Actions. And they've already got a ton of um, sample workflows, but the way that GitHub Actions works if you haven't dealt with it before is you know, essentially your workflow file is the equivalent to the YAML file I was showing you from Azure Pipelines. And then you know, essentially, Azure Pipelines is almost identical to GitHub Actions in the sense that, you know, there's hosted runners in GitHub Actions, just like we have hosted agents in Azure DevOps. You can use your own self-hosted agents as well uh, in GitHub Actions. And then there's the actions themselves, which are similar to the tasks we use in Azure DevOps. So ultimately, you just want to set up a workflow. And then you can usually find some boilerplate stuff in here. There's actually also Azure... Act, GitHub Actions. I think there was like 60 or 70 actions the last time I took a look. Um, that's like the, the source code for it. You see. I was looking for this one here, Azure Actions. Okay, so if you're coming in here kind of trying to think about what we were doing, like launch ARM templates and stuff. So here you go, deploy Azure Resource Manager template. You're also gonna see in here, there's gonna be an action for Azure Functions, right? So you can basically reverse engineer these boilerplate starters and then emulate what we did in the other one, right? If you take a look at this one here, it's very similar in, in the way that we did the one before. So this is just for ARM template development, right? Or deployment. But in a workflow file, you would say something like, you know, let's build the trigger. So on push or on push to master, stuff like that. So when we trigger the pipeline, then what are we gonna do? Well, we're gonna have a job, one or more jobs. This one is doing both build and deploy. 
So instead of a multi-stage pipeline, it's just one pipeline that uh, builds and deploys because it's just doing an ARM template, right? So uh, we give this thing a name, whatever we want. We say runs on. This would be the name of the runner in GitHub Actions, just like um, the hosted agent in Azure DevOps. And then we got our steps, right? So this workflow uses um, the, the first action, check out. We're gonna check out the master branch. Then we're gonna use Azure Login. So one of the things you would need to do, <clears throat> remember I showed you that service connection in Azure DevOps? You would also need to create a service principle if you're gonna use Azure Act, uh, GitHub Actions, excuse me. So you'd have to create basically a service principle in Azure, make sure the service principle had been given role-based access controls, and then you would need to plug in a secret in your repository, and that's what they're showing right here. So see it says, uses Azure Login with creds, and you would pop those credentials in your repository. Uh, I'll actually show you that here in just a second and show you where that would go. Um, so that one gets you logged in to the platform, right? And then let's use ARM deploy, the ARM deploy v1 action. And again, we're just uh, plugging in maybe a subscription ID, the resource group name we want to go to, and then again, the deployment.json. And, you know, if you were doing this to emulate what I was showing before, you would have something with this task first, right? And then you would have another task afterwards that does the Azure Functions action, which eventually would look something, well, they don't have an example on this one, but here is a Windows.NET function app, right? So using um, the functions action, once you get signed in and stuff, and this one, there's a good one because they're showing you like how to do a .NET build and all that kind of stuff or setting up your build agent with the right version of .NET Core, and then actually you know, restoring your dependencies and doing a build and all that stuff. But then ultimately, once that's done, right, you got your infrastructure up and running, then do your deployment, okay? So with the Azure Functions action. So anyways, that, um, that's kind of the idea. So let me show you this one last thing. If, go back to the previous uh, repository that I was on. If I wanted to use this uh, simple feed reader repository and set up my workflow and do GitHub Actions, I would just go over to security and um, let's see here, or is it under settings? Settings, uh, integrations, oh, secrets, sorry, I'm getting confused. So when you're in your repository, you go to settings, you go to secrets, create a new secret, and then you would give this thing a name. And in these sample documents, you see them use Azure credentials, but you would need to paste in the output here uh, that you would get from running uh, the command to create a service principle, right? So there, from the CLI, there's an AZ SP create for RBAC. And uh, so this command right here, zoom back in so you can see this. So when you run this command, AZ AD SP create for RBAC, and then you say SDK auth, then it's gonna build a service principle. And do they show the output in here? Didn't really show the output. So let me just run it and I'll show you kind of the idea. Well, you know what, I gotta have inputs and stuff to tell it like which, you know, which role and all that kind of stuff. But um, basically that's what you wanna do. When you run the command or even better, you run something like this where you're saying, hey, create a service principle Here's the name. It's gonna need contributor access at this scope. You would need to plug in like the resource group unique ID or resource ID, something like that. So you can tightly control what the service principal can access. That command would return a JSON response. And then all you gotta do is plug the JSON in right here. Click on add secret. And now you've got a variable that you can use uh, within GitHub Actions. You can just say env dot Azure credentials or whatever it was or was a secret, something like that, right? So that's how you would navigate that. That would delegate permissions to get up actions and do deployments for you. And uh, that's kind of the end of my presentation. So what I'll do here, I'll make sure you guys get the PDF that has all the links, has the links to this article, the thing in the uh, architecture center, as well as the source code. And uh, I appreciate your guys' time today.